let's lift our hands and our voices. Oh, I think we can do a lot better than that. He's worthy. Praise God. I'm not going to let some honky tonk. I'm not going to let some thumping bass in a car next door to me make more noise than someone that's been brought out, called out, stayed out by the power of the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. While you're turning in your Bibles to Acts chapter number 17, um, I'm going to get right into this for the sake of time. And I just love the purity of this people. And this meeting is excellent. And um, I would not be where I am today without the leadership um, that has established this movement. Those that are in the honorary executive council are true heroes. You don't need to be looking in this world for heroes. Trust me, they are in the kingdom of God. The real deal. And uh, we love and appreciate every one of them. And then uh, my brethren on the general council, we appreciate you, Brother Erskine. It is an honor to be invited to address these home missionaries and this great congregation this afternoon. And then, of course, I want to give honor to my pastor and my pastor's wife, who were instrumental in helping me see the deeper things of God. And there is no question that I would not be where I am doing what I'm doing without their vital placement in my life. And I appreciate them and their family that's here also. We appreciate them so very, very much. And last and not least, my beautiful, loving wife, And also my daughter and her husband are here, and we love them, appreciate them also. Acts chapter number 17, we're going to read several verses of scripture here. And um, I don't normally read scripture this way, so please uh, forgive me for this, but we're going to read four and then jump and read one and then a couple more and then one more. Acts 17 verses 1 through 4. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. Everybody said a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. That means there was a lot. And then going to verse number 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Verse number 19. And they took him and brought him unto Aropagos, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear some new thing. Verse number 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear of thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed uh, among the which was Dionysus, the Aropagot, And a woman named Damaris and others with them. And then Acts chapter 18 and verse number 1. After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And I want to preach to us for a few moments here about lessons from Mars Hill. Lessons 
from Mars Hill. One more time, could we lift our hands and our voices and open our hearts? Oh, I know the Holy Ghost has already moved. But God, we're praying for something extra special. By the authority of the name of Jesus, your power, your unction, your anointing, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. We give you great praise and great glory in Jesus' name. Right before you're seated, shake somebody's hand and greet them. And then you may be seated in Jesus' name. I appreciate uh, Brother Jess Parker so very much, and uh, actually Brother and Sister Parker. And if I had one word that I could sum up these tremendous people, it would just be real, real. And I thank God in in a world full of facade and shine and shimmer that there are real people. And uh, love and appreciate them and appreciate what he had to say very, very much. In the entirety of the recorded ministry of the Apostle Paul, it is our theological opinion that there is no other message than the message that was given on Mars Hill that has been more studied and scrutinized over the last 2,000 years. After great revival in Thessalonica and immediate persecution, and as a home missionary, you need to learn early on that persecution and resistance is not a negative. Because with everything going forward, there is a pushback. And Paul And Silas and Timotheus experienced this in Acts 17, the first few verses. They then depart for Berea. They are there. And then there are those at Thessalonica that hear that they are in Berea and send men of the baser sort over there. And so Paul is quickly ushered to Athens. He is alone there. He immediately begins, as his manner was, to preach in the synagogue. Paul also began to preach in the city, on the streets. And there were those that came in contact with Paul while he was preaching in the streets of Athens. That said, you know, we have never heard this before. We need to to get this into the proper environment. So we can hear a little bit more about this new doctrine. Others said, we need to hear what this babbler has to say. This word babbler in the Greek literally means a seed picker. It is a derogatory term that literally was the description of a small bird that would pick up seeds here and there, which means that they did not view him respectfully. They did not view him as really being a man that had something important to add, but such as their manner was in Athens at this time, to hear some new thing, to critique it, and to pick it apart. And so the Apostle Paul is ushered to the Oropagos, or Mars Hill, to give this incredible exercise of oratory and what some biblical expositors have reduced to a speech. There are some, without going through an exegesis here this afternoon, there are several things that I want to just talk about uh, in Paul's address on Mars Hill. Number one is that he used the familiar to them. He used their poets when he used the term for we are his offspring. This was a direct quote from a poet that literally was raised in Paul's hometown of Tarsus. And then 
Paul, in one of his rare occasions, revealed the incommunicable attributes of God. It is in one of only two messages in the entire uh, entirety of Paul's ministry that he uses the incommunicable attributes of God. These are attributes that are beyond resonate having any resonating component within you and I. Of course, the communicable attributes of God would be His love, His paternity, and His mercy, and and uh, His grace towards us. Something that resonates within each and every one of us. Only here in Acts 17 and in Acts 14 at Lystra did the Apostle Paul make a reference. To the omnipresence, the ubiquitous, uh, the ubiquitousness of God, and it's very interesting to note that he used that um, in Acts chapter number seventeen, and then he does sprinkle in this message some theological fragments of repentance, judgment, the Godhead, and the resurrection. I do not. I'm not looking to throw Paul under the bus this morning. I have far too much respect for him. And I am a great student of his writings and appreciate of his influence. However, in apostolic terms, there was not much that happened uh, on Mars Hill. You have uh, Dionysus and then you also have Damaris and you have a small handful of unnamed people that never are mentioned again in Holy Writ and neither is there ever a church mentioned being started in Athens. And then also as an extreme exclamation point, we read in Acts 18 and 1 that after these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. I'd like to to just give my word there. He got out of there as quick as he could. In fact, in my mind's eye, I almost see this small handful of people that were impressed with his oratory and his use of rhetoric and a few terms that they had never heard before garnered enough interest. I can see them almost following Paul as he makes his way uh, to the dock or, or some means of mode of transportation, some beast of burden to leave Athens. The glory days of Hellenism has already begun to wane at this time of Paul's visit to Mars Hill. The great and glorious influence of philosophers such as Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates had already come and gone. And what was remained is what one biblical expositor remarking said, the wisdom of Greece had greatly departed and dissipated, leaving a bunch of immature, self-indulgent, self-glorifying intellectuals who truly believed that they were smarter than everybody else. Kind of sounds like a lot of people in our world today. But all of the kaleidoscope of philosophical thought and ideals had already began to filter down, leaving two major groups, the Epicureans, that believed that pleasure was the guiding principle of life and the Stoics that believed in a life of severity and control. This message that Paul gave begins by Paul becoming so stirred in his spirit that the city is wholly given over to idolatry. It is a known fact that in Athens there were over 30,000 idolatrous statues that were in honor to uh, these false deities. And Paul was grieved in his spirit after coming from the great revival in Thessalonica and finding earnest people willing to study the Bible in Berea. He is immediately stirred and He formulates a message um, in which he begins by addressing uh, his message to the unknown God. Um, I have to be honest with you that I marvel at this message. And it has become such a heralded message of oratory and rhetoric that the denominational world has viewed this as the watermark 
of, of preaching in the book of Acts. They look at Acts chapter number 17 and Paul's uh, message, his discourse in Acts chapter number 17 and in study for this message today. Um, I, I was blown away by how many denominational theologians look at this as the apex of apostolic preaching because it was the infusing of uh, the enculturation that had been so expressed in in uh, in the um, influence of Greek culture and then Paul infusing uh, the use of a poet and Paul weaving his way through and addressing bringing to the table the omnipotence of God and the omnipresence of God in him we move and breathe and have our being so on and so forth. But I wonder aloud here today if really this was an aberration in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Jesus addressed this method of ministry when he said, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, Take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate whatsoever shall be given you in that hour that you speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Home missionary, don't be worried about what everybody's going to think. Don't worry about you having every I dotted and every T crossed. Just get into the Holy Ghost. Don't worry about modeling your greatest sermon. Don't worry about bringing some some view of what you see in your community and wrapping it around with some uh, some theological text and trying to, trying to address the particular needs of your culture. But if you'll just rear back and preach, thus saith the Lord, you can preach a church into existence. I'm here to tell you, you can preach a church into existence. If you'll just get out of the way and let God speak, God knows the secrets of men's hearts. God knows where they were last night, last month, last year, and God knows where they're headed. True anointed preaching is a supernatural event. And how many of you appreciate real supernatural apostolic preaching? Preaching that gives revelation. Preaching that brings understanding. Preaching that breaks chains. Preaching that breaks habits. Preaching that breaks you out of prison. Preaching that takes you to another level. Preaching that breaks you out and preaching that takes you in. Oh, clap your hands and give God praise. Thank God for real preaching. Praise God. Real Holy Ghost preaching. Anointed preaching. Is a supernatural event. And if you had to put it in topographical terms. It would be vertical. It is from God to man. It is from the spirit to the flesh. It is from heaven to earth. But this message in Acts chapter number 17 was not vertical. It was horizontal. And it was a message that was crafted carefully to meet the needs of a people that were in bondage to idolatry but did not set them free from sin. Under closer examination, this discourse and carefully crafted message appears to be an aberration and a deviation for the Apostle Paul. Now, I know you're being quiet right now. Because you're probably thinking this guy is saying that that preaching was not what it was supposed to be, and you can think that. But we have evidences that the Apostle Paul had great revival with a different message. In fact, in my little Bible program on my cell phone, it says that 
the book of First Thessalonians was written in Athens. And that can't be true because in the salutation in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, you see the reuniting of Timotheus and Silas, which means the Thessalonians was not written in Athens. It was written in Corinth. Notice this with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verses 4 and 5. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel... Even so, we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is a witness. And I, ladies and gentlemen, that sounds very familiar to me. Because when I compare that to 1 Corinthians 2 and 1, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Paul used that exact same methodology in Thessalonica, where there was a great revival of a multitude of Greeks and Jews. And he used that same methodology in Corinth. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 5. For our gospel came un, not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. That sounds awful familiar to me. Because in 1 Corinthians 2 and 4, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and with power. Brothers and sisters, the one thing we've got to have in the 21st century is not a bunch of rhetoric, but we've got to have the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. In Thessalonica, there was a demonstration. In Thessalonica, there was anointed preaching. In Thessalonica, there was anointed ministry. But when Paul got to Mars Hill, he got so affected because of his previous and prior influence of reading Greek literature and being influenced by Hellenism that it somehow brought him to a place of trying to craft a message. And he said, you know what? Nothing happened. I, I missed it here. I know that this was this was." Probably good rhetoric. And when he got to Corinth, God visited him. And he said, you don't be quiet. You preach. I have much people in this city. And Paul reared back. And he said, I'm going to, I'm going to cap a little coup on what happened in Athens. And I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach. What would have happened if Paul preached on Mars Hill that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we're able to ask or think. Clap your hands and give him praise. Oh, let's thank God for the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God and the salvation. And then finally, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 9, Paul witnesses himself for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how we turned to God from idols. This is in Thessalonica. This is before Paul got to Athens. He already saw that God was able to deliver people from idolatry. But yet when he saw 30,000 statues, instead of preaching, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There's only one God. There's only... Something intimidated him. Something caused him to be wowed in Athens. I'm telling you that what you need to do is go to your city and not worry about how much money they've got and how big the buildings are and how big the megachurch is. You preach. You can't argue with deliverance. You can't argue with the move of the Holy Ghost. You can't argue with people that are delivered. You can't argue with people that are separated. You can't argue with the healing. You can't argue with the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Somebody clap your hands and give him praise. I want to tell you what. It's awesome to meet people in a coffee shop. And I love coffee, so that just comes easy. And starting your church in a coffee shop will work. 
but somewhere they got to go somewhere where you can lift your hands and lift your voice and do some dancing in the spirit and they can see the power and the demonstration of the living God a God that's greater than the philosophies of this world a God that's greater than the ideologies of this world a God that's greater than anything happening in this city You that are starting churches and you were evangelists, you don't have to shine your message up when you go to your city. You just go into your city and open up your Bible. And if you've got Acts 38, you preach it. If you've got Deuteronomy 6 and 4, you preach it. It's the spirit that doeth the work. Let's clap our hands and give him praise right now. Man, I'm not putting down Paul. I feel like I know this man. I feel like I know this man through the scriptures and and the spirit that I see in the scriptures. I'm not against him. I think the apostle Paul knew it was a great message of rhetoric. It was carefully carefully crafted to, to address and appeal to philosophy of this world. But he also knew I just came from a revival where they were having chains broken off them. I just preach a revival. When you get to your city, don't worry about competing with Joel Olstein and everybody else. You just Just preach, 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 preach with passion, but preach. And God will give the increase. Oh, let's give him praise. I wonder what the results would have been. If the Apostle Paul would have preached there that he preached in Thessalonica, sandwiched between two great revivals, perhaps it was an experiment. There's, there's room for that, except that in some cases you only got one shot. If you only got one shot, if you get audience with the mayor, it's no time to talk about community service. It's talking about, sir, have you ever felt the presence of God? I'm not getting very many amens right now. This is all I know how to do. This is all I know how to do it. I heard the story. I heard the story a while back about a man that lived in a cul-de-sac and three doors down was the city mayor. And and, uh, they would cut lawn, wave to each other and and, uh, talk to each other, just a little small talk and... And uh, this church member, every once in a while, he'd say, you know, uh, I go to this church right over here. We'd love to have you. And and uh, the day came that the mayor said, you know, I'm coming to your church on Sunday. And the guy panicked. He said, oh, man. He called the pastor up. He said, pastor, he said, listen. He said, the mayor is, said he's going to come to church on Sunday. And the pastor said, man, that's great. And the man said, uh, could you? Could, could we quiet it down a little bit? And, and uh, Pastor said, "Well, I, I don't understand what what you're asking." He said, "Well, you know, Sister Susie, she she jumps up and flings bobby pins like fifty caliber bullets and flinging all over the walls and whipping her hair around. And then there's old Joe, the alcoholic, that got healed and put his marriage back together. And he wore hoops as he run. And you know what? The pastor said, "You know what? Just let's 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 just leave this in God's hands." And the day came, and the man came in. And they sat in the back row, and he brought the mayor with him. And the mayor was sitting there. And all of a sudden, here comes old Joe. And the the drums begin to go, and the praises go up, and he takes a lap. And and then sure enough, here's Sister Susie and a bunch of other sisters and people running the aisles. This man got down in his pews and just and just put his head in his hands and started weeping. And minutes went by and the Holy Ghost took over. Minutes went by. When he finally looked up, the mayor had his hands lifted, speaking in other tongues with the brother. With his head. Let's quit worrying about the big eyes and the little youth and think it's a sinner. I don't care what their sin is. God is the sin breaker. Jesus is the sin breaker. Jesus is a prison saving savior. Come on, let's give him praise. Come on. You're going to do it. You are doing it. Just preach, 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 preach. 
When you feel like your back is against the wall and you're in your own private hell, just remember 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 through 20, when Jesus went and preached to the spirits of hell. But Jesus said, I ain't staying here. I'm leading captivity captive. Come on, let's praise him. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Let's create a praise blaze around here today. There's a home missionary think, I don't have enough. I ain't doing enough. Listen, you knock me, you do your part, you let God do his part. Hallelujah. Peter got in there writing that letter to the Corinthians. He said, be not deceived. He started going down a list of those that won't be entering into the kingdom of God. He said, fornicators. And he said, he reminded himself, idolaters. He wanted Athens to know you're always on my mind. When I think about what God could have done, when I think about what God could do, when I think about what, what I could have done and should have done. And he had a revival in Thessalonica and had a revival in Corinth. In fact, because Paul just let loose and let God be God in Corinth, the Bible says, and such were some of you. Oh, let us never forget the pit in which we were dug. Let us never forget the chains that we had on us when we walked into a building like this. I walked in, I walked into a building that was in South Sacramento on Calvine. Is that Brother Bob Bertram right there? I love you. Brother Bob Bertram was the very first man to pray for me when I was hit an altar. My pastor, Brother Wilson, preached that service. I walked in, it was throw down carpet, didn't look near as nice as this, folding metal chairs, the air conditioning ductwork was just like big old arms and Bishop Wilson preached and Sister Wilson, that's when she used to sing and play I was just an old heavy metal rock and roller but I'm going to tell you something, when I walked in there first thing I thought is, I said these people look different I mean, I had bleach white hair and red go-go boots and you looked at me funny and I looked at you funny. But when the worship went up, what looked ordinary became supernatural. Don't be ashamed of your separation. That's what's keeping the anointing rich and real. Don't apologize for your holiness. That's what's keeping the angel of the Lord leading sinners to your front door. Don't be, don't apologize when you see people going south. You say, I'm not leaving this. I'm ready to die for the truth, Bishop. I'm ready to have real revival. Come on, let's clap our hands and give them praise. It's coming. It's here. If you've got people in your city, it's there. It's there. It's there. It's there. God bless you. You may be seated. About 12 years ago, we were in our uh, third building, the one previous to the one we're in now. And uh, I uh, got a call from one of the ushers about... An hour and a half before service, he said, Pastor, are you on your way to church? I said, I'll be there in about 20 minutes. He said, there's a guy here to see you. I said, okay. And uh, called me back in about 10 minutes. He said, Pastor, are you on your way? I said, I'm just about to walk out the door. He said, this guy's really different. And I said, okay, well, I was really different too. And when I walked in... There was a man that walked up and introduced himself as the drag queen of Seattle. That means he was a transvestite. He dressed up like a woman and he competed. He was dying of AIDS and wanted to be saved. 
before that service was over, he had repented of his sins, was baptized in Jesus' name, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't tell me you can't influence this world. God's after everybody. God's after everybody. God's after everybody. Let's clap our hands and let these rafters roar. God, I'm wanting to be in alignment with you. I'll take anybody that you want to send me. I'll receive anybody that you want to bring here. Paul said, and such were some of you. When he just reared back and preached and said, I'm going to let the Holy Ghost work. There was a revival of homosexuals, effeminate, drunkards, idolaters, and such were some of you. If we'll just get out of the way and say, God, you do the saving and I'll do the preaching. God will bring them in from the north. God will bring them in from the south. God will bring them in from the east. God will bring them in from everywhere. Without bias, without prejudice, without prejudging, without preconceived notions. Man, there's something breaking right there. Let's clap our hands again. Come on, we got to get this. We got to get this. We're writing the book of Acts together. We are in the most exciting day of the church. You're going to say, God, I'm seeing weird things. God can save weird people. God can save freakish people. God can save anybody. I'm here to tell you, God can save anybody. (laughs) Nothing wrong with rhetoric. Nothing wrong with homiletics. Nothing wrong with with fashioning something. But it needs to stay anointed. It needs to meet the sin problem. It needs to rattle chains. It needs to open prison houses. It needs to bring people out and take people in. Part of the struggle that we're facing is we are facing a world that is biblically illiterate. And 25, 30 years ago, you could have a Bible study with anybody, regardless of denominational affiliation, and they would have enough fragmentation of the word for you to begin to, to lead them from whatever particular vantage point they had. As notable research groups as the Barna Group and the Pew Research Foundation recently took A poll among Americans and found that fewer than half adults in America can name the four Gospels. Sixty percent of Americans cannot name five of the Ten Commandments. Eighty-two percent of Americans believe that God helps those that help themselves. They believe it's a verse in the Bible. Those professing to be born again only did better by 1%. A recent study of high school seniors, over half of those polled, thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were a husband and wife in the Old Testament. The homosexuals are saying they were born this way. The transgenders are saying they were born wrong. We need to understand God is positioning this thing for the greatest revival. You must be born again. Let's go ahead and have a demonstration and then I'll tell him how to get it. Let's go ahead and have a demonstration. Now when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place and suddenly there was a demonstration and then a proclamation. Come on, clap your hands and give God the praise. We've got the greatest thing this world has ever seen. It's a demonstration of the power and the spirit of God. Come on, let's do that again. Give that to Jesus. In the remainder of this conference, let's have a demonstration. Let's have a demonstration. If it's just two or three of you in church, just have a demonstration. Just have a demonstration of the power. (laughs) 
Praise God. Praise God. Our very first church service in Spokane, Washington, 23 years ago, there was a man that was in the latter stages of dying of emphysema. They had to sign special paperwork to get him out of the hospital. Brought him to church. A bunch of family members brought him to church. Somebody in Sacramento, I told him there's a church you need to go to in Spokane. I had never met, never seen any one of these people in my entire life. It was my wife, myself, my three-year-old son, and my one-year-old daughter. And I was the preacher. And the janitor. And the usher. The offering giver and the offering taker. The Kleenex box remover and reinstaller. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say, my wife and I, we were taught, we were taught how to have a move of God from our home church. You take what you got in your home church and you replicate that. You duplicate. You may be looking at empty chairs. You go ahead and have a demonstration. God's going to make sure a demonstration doesn't go to wait. He's going to bring them in. He's going to direct them. He's going to lead them to you. God does not let a demonstration go to waste. My wife, and my wife played the keyboards and I shouted. I jumped all over. People think, well, that doesn't look very intelligent. Who cares about intelligence at that point? Go to Wilson University and get that type of intelligence and you'll be running the aisles, dancing, shouting, and everything will be fine. Um, tr- trust me. I'm a much better student at 60 than I was at 16. When I was 16, I was permanently kicked out of high school in my junior year for drugs. I'm not preaching against spiritual education by any means, but I'm going to tell you, this highfalutin stuff coming from the universities, if you're going to go to a university, why don't you go to one that's, that's being taught by apostolic people? You're saying they, they paid you to do that. I'm, nobody told me to say anything. I'm saying this because I believe this. But if you get five minutes with your college professor, don't bow to that philosophy. You say, have you ever experienced the Holy Ghost? My God, the homosexuals aren't afraid of coming out of the closet. I think it's time for the church to come out of the church building and hit the streets with the power and the demonstration of an almighty God. Come on, clap your hands and give him praise. My God, I feel it. It's resting on somebody here today. I'm going to go home and get with it. I'm going to go home. I, I'm going to quit feeling sorry for myself. I'm just going to. I'm just going to get in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach. I remember one time I told my wife. We'd only been there a couple months. I told my wife. I said, "Honey, I have a message from God." And she said, I believe it. And uh, we got to church and we had just a, probably count the people in our church on one hand, maybe, maybe two. And had a brother named Jim in the back that I designated an usher so I didn't have to do it. And Sister Betsy that caught the bus at about 8.30. And she... Uh, she told me that she said, now pastor, she said, I have to catch a bus. So please don't think I'm being rude. And so at 830, she got up very quietly and curtsied and made her way to the door down to the bus stop. And now it's my wife, my three-year-old son, my one-year-old daughter that did their best to behave. And Jim, my head usher. And I'm thinking, you know, surely there's more people coming. I've got a message from God. God gave it to me. And I got up and preached. Brother Erskine, like the building was full. And I preached I preach that this church is going to have revival. That the spirits of this city are going to be broken. And we're going to have great revival. And on the way home, I was driving. I looked over at my wife. I said, honey, I really felt like God gave me God the message. She said, he did. He gave it for you. God will encourage you. You just preach. You just believe it and preach it. 
God will bring the people. God will bring the masses. Come on, I feel like you're getting this. I feel like there's somebody that's going to go home and say, you know what? I'm going to speak it into existence. I'm going to get rid of the, I'm going to get rid of the bitterness and of why it's not happening fast enough and the comparisons with everybody else. I'm almost done. Jess Parker got to preach two hours, so I'm preaching two hours. <laughs> Brother Booker did it. Uh. This Holy Ghost, this body of Christ, my local church that God directly by his own hands to led, led me to, my beautiful wife that I met in church, these are the most precious, incredible things in my life. This culture that has been developed and nurtured by the Holy Ghost and you as a pastor. Maybe you're just a home missionary and you're saying, we, we don't have a culture. Yeah, you have a culture. If you're preaching truth and you're separated, you have a culture. But this culture, you have to understand from one that has been on the other side of the wall. People are looking for it. But people are like they are in the book of Genesis. They are like blind men that are that are at, at the wall and at the door. Many of these people have no idea where the door is. They're just, they're grasping. They're looking. Don't make fun of people on drugs. They're trying to cope with the spirits of this world the best they can. Don't make fun of tweakers and alcoholics and, and all this kind of stuff. They are, they are maintaining because they don't have anything else. You ought to walk on the scene and say, I've got something from another world. That'll turn you inside out. It'll give you joy like a river. It'll give you peace. You can sleep at night. It'll give you contentment. It'll give you power. Oh, let's clap our hands and give him praise. I'm going to go home and get with it. I'm going to go home with a fresh perspective and I'm going to watch God change anybody, everybody, anybody, anytime, any place, everywhere. Twelve percent of Americans polled thought that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. That's cartoonish. That is so, that's what we're dealing with in our culture today. You may not always be able to give a Bible study with some kind of a response because on the other side of the table, there, there's nothing. There's nothing. There's no roots. There's not even rocks. There's not pebbles. There's nothing. It's vacant. It's a vacant lot. But after you've met him in the coffee shop and you've talked to him about what God can do, when you get to the church, you make sure we're, we're having a demonstration today. Everybody's going to fast on Saturday. Everybody's going to meet here early for prayer. We are having a demonstration here today because honey, once those shackles come off, that first man in our, at our very first service, we prayed for him and God healed him. His cancer went into remission. We baptized him the very next day in a whirlpool tub on the seventh floor of the big hospital in Spokane. We ended up baptizing 25, 25 of his family members, they said, oh my God, if God did it for him, I wonder if he can get me off drugs. I wonder if he can get me off alcohol. I wonder if he can heal my marriage. I wonder if he can deliver my children. It's the power and the demonstration. Come on, clap your hands and give him praise. Give him praise. I want to take a demonstration with me. You are a walking demonstration. You are a walking demonstration of what the power of God can do. If you're a home missionary, you're a church planner, maybe you're pastoring a smaller work, you want to take it to the next level. I want to invite you to come down to the front right now. Let's all be seated. I'm sorry. I want you to come. Church planners, maybe you want to take your church to another level. I want to invite you to come down to the front. Here comes my son-in-law and my daughter. They just took a church in Sandpoint, Idaho. 
It's going to happen. I've been telling them it's going to happen there. It's going to happen there. If God did it here, God will do it there. Some of you folks way in the back, I need you to help. I went one entire year. I went one entire year in the first four years that my wife and I were in Spokane. Where we had no Bible studies and we had no baptisms. The resistance was that tough. We were knocking doors. We were handing out tracts. We were doing everything we could. And I'll never forget this, Brother Elder, as long as I live. I told my wife, I said, I'm going to the church to pray. And when I got to the church, the devil started telling me, it's too hard. It's too hard. It's too hard. I kept praying. I kept driving. I came pushing. And finally, God showed up and said, if I can do it in Durham, I can do it here. If I can do it in Sacramento, I can do it here. If I can do it in Modesto, these are, these are men that I all hold in incredible esteem and have been to their churches and seen the great things that God was doing. God can do it where you are. Let's lift our hands and let's pray. I'm now inviting church to come up behind them. Men of God, church of God, come up behind these and pray. Go home with a demonstration. Don't go home with a chip on your shoulder. Don't go home looking around and saying, well, I wonder why it's not happened for me. The devil's trying to wait you out. The devil's trying to pollute what God is going to bring to pass. If God did it here, God will do it there. If God did it in Spokane, God will do it where you, oh yes, he will. It comes with a demonstration. It comes with preaching the truth. It comes with separation. It comes with loving people. Yes, 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 yes. I'm telling you, it's coming to your place. I'm telling you, it's already there. It's already there. We have to adjust what we're looking at. We have to adjust the battles we're fighting. We have to adjust our causes and make sure that we're in alignment. It's there. Yes, 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 yes. 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 I've listened to the lies of the devil as long as I shall. I will have revival. My God, yes, 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 yes. God can give you that building. God can open the door. God can increase finances. God knows how to do it. God knows how to develop you. God knows how to bless you. God knows how to lead the hungry and thirsty to a demonstration. My God, it's here. It's here. It's here. Get it. Get it. Go with it. Go with it. Who cares what the color of their skin is? Who cares what their language is? Who cares what their background is? God is able! Oh, yes, 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 yes. Said it's done. Come on, believe it. 